Good evening and welcome to NTD News. I'm Stephanie Cox. Here are today's top stories. A kindergarten in Ukraine is hit with artillery shells and Moscow expels a U.S. diplomat. Could the Russian invasion we've been hearing so much about be right around the corner? President Biden shares his prediction. A Canadian hacker claims responsibility for leaking the names of the people who donated to the Freedom Convoy through Give, Send, Go. Meanwhile, Canadian banks are starting to freeze protesters' accounts under the Emergencies Act. A bail fund organization under Black Lives Matter has paid a $100,000 bail for an activist accused of attempted murder. A mayoral candidate says he's traumatized to find out the person who allegedly tried to kill him is out on bail. The Boston mayor's vaccine mandate for three public safety unions has been paused. Those police officers and firefighters won't lose their jobs for now, but the case is still ongoing. An NBA free agent nominated for the Nobel Peace Prize. His stance on China's human rights violations and the outcry from his ongoing unemployment. A kindergarten in Ukraine was struck by artillery shells today, wounding civilians. Ukraine's military said Russia-backed troops were behind the attack. The Biden administration is again warning that a Russia invasion is around the corner. Russia also expelled a U.S. official from Moscow today. NTD's Melina Weiskup brings us the latest details. The president today with the same warning we've heard for weeks. A Russian invasion is around the corner. Because they're prepared to go into Ukraine, attack Ukraine. I, my sense this will happen within the next several days. But Thursday, Russia appeared to ramp up its aggression. A Ukrainian kindergarten building was shelled with heavy weapons, wounding at least three civilians and causing building damage. Positions in this uh, preschool were uh, about 20 children. So they were evacuated to nearest house. Pro-Russian forces in turn pointed fingers at the Ukrainian military, accusing them of opening fire on their territory four times in the past 24 hours. This is in the Donbass region, right in between Russia and Ukraine, and occupied by two unrecognized separatist states. It's been a tense area over the past eight years. The U.S. and NATO have been warning about false flag operations. Secretary of State Antony Blinken emphasized that message again this morning to the United Nations. This could be a violent event that Russia will blame on Ukraine or an outrageous accusation that Russia will level against the Ukrainian government. The Kremlin claims it pulled some forces back, but the U.S. says Russia has added 7,000 troops along the Ukrainian border in recent days. We see some of those troops inch closer to that border. We see them fly in more combat and support aircraft. And Russia's backlash is now targeting the U.S. diplomatically. Thursday morning, the Russian government expelled the second highest ranking American diplomat from the U.S. Embassy in Moscow. Russia's actions against our deputy chief was unprovoked. And while this conflict is far from our shores, it could hike gas prices, President Biden warned earlier this week. The U.S. is now more dependent on Russia for petroleum, and we could see that more clearly at the pump over the coming weeks. Congress has been working on a bill to sanction Russia in the case of a full-scale attack, but failed to reach an agreement this week before leaving D.C. We weren't able to come to agreement with our Republican colleagues on the very specific details of a preemptive sanctions package. And because senators couldn't come to an agreement to pass that bill to place sanctions on Russia, they instead today turned to a resolution. That's pretty much a symbolic way of saying that the U.S. Congress is still unified in taking action to hold Russia accountable. Reporting in Washington, D.C., Melina Weiskup, NTD News. Hundreds of Canadian truckers are bracing for a possible police crackdown as they protest against COVID-19 restrictions. This morning, police poured into Canada's capital city. And TD's Chenny Wu brings us more. There's over 150 plus police cars, uh, prisoner transport wagons. There's six buses getting ready to load guys up. 
Officers on Thursday delivered a third round of warnings, advising drivers how and where to pick up their trucks if they're towed. This comes after Prime Minister Justin Trudeau invoked the never-before-used Emergencies Act on Monday. One protester says he's not prepared to budge and challenges the legality of Trudeau's Emergencies Act invocation. It has to pass through two more levels in Parliament. They cannot act on that. They are acting unlawfully and they are acting under unlawful orders. The Emergencies Act is a temporary 30-day measure that comes into effect immediately when invoked, but must be approved by Canada's parliament within seven days. The act gives the government enormous power, in this case enabling measures such as freezing bank accounts, towing away trucks and arresting drivers. And not far from the demonstrators, tensions run high in the House of Commons as Trudeau defends his push for the Emergencies Act. We want to lower the temperature across the country. The Prime Minister clearly wants to raise it. Trudeau sparked outrage in Parliament Wednesday when he accused a Jewish member of Parliament of supporting swastikas. Conservative Party members can stand with people who wave swastikas. They can stand with people who wave uh, the Confederate flag. We will choose to stand with Canadians who deserve to be able to get to their jobs, who will be able to get their lives back. These illegal protests need to stop, and they will, Mr. Speaker. It prompted a rebuke by the Speaker to avoid inflammatory language in the House on both sides. Trudeau says the Emergencies Act will protect individual rights. We're not limiting people's freedom of expression. We're not limiting freedom of peaceful assembly. We're not preventing people from exercising their right to protest legally. We are, in fact, reinforcing the principles, values and institutions that keep all Canadians free. However, Conservatives in Parliament accuse Trudeau of overreach and say the Emergencies Act is unnecessary. If Canadians are to trust their government, their government needs to trust Canadians. Those are the words of the Prime Minister in 2015. Same Prime Minister six years later as he fans the flames of an unjustified national emergency. So, Mr. Speaker, when did the Prime Minister lose his way? When did it happen? The Prime Minister is doing this to save his own political skin. But, Mr. Speaker, this is not a game. It comes at the cost to Canadians' rights and freedoms. Speaker, Parliament should not allow the Prime Minister to avoid responsibility in this way. I urge all members of this House, proceed with extreme caution. The truckers' movement, known as the Freedom Convoy, initially began as a protest against COVID-19 vaccine mandates. Chen Wu, NTD News. A civil rights group in Canada is suing Trudeau's government for invoking the Emergencies Act. The Canadian Civil Liberties Association says it's unwarranted to invoke the act and that existing laws are enough to deal with the protests and blockades. They call the emergency measures unconstitutional. And whoever hacked Give, Send, Go doxed over 90,000 people who donated to the trucker convoy's fundraiser. A renowned hacker is now taking responsibility for the cyber attack on camera. NTD's Miguel Moreno has the video. The Canadian trucker convoy has raised nearly $10 million in donations on Give, Send, Go, an American crowdfunding website. But tens of thousands of people who donated to the fundraiser were doxxed by a hacker. That means their names and email addresses were made public. During an undated social media live stream, Canadian Aubrey Cottle claimed that he hacked the company. Yes, I doxed the truckers! I did it! It was me! I hacked Give, Send, Go, baby! And I do it again! Cottle is said to have co-founded hacktivist group Anonymous. In some of his TikTok videos, he speaks about Give, Send, Go's purported cybersecurity loopholes. On February 7th, Cotto said, It'd be a real shame if something were to happen to Give, Send, Go. But we can't verify whether he truly is behind the cyber attack. We reached out to Give, Send, Go for comment, but we haven't heard back. In an emailed statement to NTD News, the FBI said they do not have a comment. Whoever hacked the company has put some people under pressure. According to the Ottawa Citizen Media Company, a fundraiser donor closed down her cafe in Ottawa, Canada after her identity was revealed by the hacker. 
She said that people called her, threatening to throw bricks at her window, threatening to come after her. The owner now regrets making the $250 donation, saying she no longer condones the ongoing demonstration. Another Canadian newsroom reports that a worker for the Ontario government was fired after Ontario tied her to a $100 donation. Miguel Moreno, NTD News. And it's not just crowdfunding services. Banks in Canada are starting to freeze accounts connected to the Freedom Convoy. And an hours-long online outage also hit some major Canadian banks last night. NTD's Alison Lee has more. Banks in Canada are already freezing accounts involved with the Freedom Convoy protests under the Emergencies Act. Canadian federal police have started sharing names of individuals and corporations, as well as their cryptocurrency wallets with banks. Financial service providers have already taken action based on that information. The emergency measures we put in place are being used. They are having an impact and they will have a growing impact in the days to come. Under the Emergencies Act, banks also have to report account information of those involved in the protests to Canada's national security organizations. Canadian Finance Minister Christia Freeland refuses to say how many accounts were frozen, but warns that more will be frozen in the future. We now have the tools to follow the money we can see what is happening and what is being planned in real time. Sean Zimmer is one of the protesters in Ottawa who says his bank account was frozen. He told Rebel News Wednesday that he got a call from the local credit union. They told him that his account has been suspended for funding the protests. We have ways to go around this. Now to get into what happened, I have been assisting freedom fighters uh, getting finances to their families to make sure that their children are fed and they have a warm roof over their head. And in doing so, my account was flagged and they froze my account, not allowing me to send any transfers, receive any transfers, pay my bills. Also on Wednesday, customers of Canada's five major banks reported that online and mobile banking services went down for hours. This reportedly impacted RBC, TD, CIBC, Bank of Montreal and Scotiabank. So far, only RBC officially acknowledged the outage. They said hours later that they fixed the problem. It's unclear if the outage has to do with the Emergencies Act powers regulating financial transactions. Alison Lee, NTD News. A bail fund organization under Black Lives Matter has paid a $100,000 bail for an alleged attempted murderer, Quintez Brown. Brown allegedly went to the office of a Louisville mayoral candidate and opened fire. And TD's Jason Perry has the story. In that exact moment, just, you know, you don't know what's going on. You're just hoping for, for safety, and it all happens in an instant. Craig Greenberg is an attorney, and he's currently running for mayor of Louisville, Kentucky. An individual walked into our campaign office yesterday morning. There were five of us gathered for a morning meeting in my office. Uh, we asked if we could help him, and he pulled out a gun, aimed it directly at me, and opened fire. Uh, I was fortunate that one of my brave teammates slammed the door uh, shut. We, they were able to throw some desks on top of the door, and the suspect fled. The suspected gunman was identified as Quintez Brown, a 21-year-old social justice activist. Fortunately, no one was hurt, with only one of the bullets grazing the candidate's sweater. Police later arrested Brown less than half a mile from the scene. He was charged with attempted murder and four counts of wanton endangerment, and he pleaded not guilty to all charges. Two days later, a Black Lives Matter bail fund organization paid Brown's $100,000 bail, and Brown was released on house arrest. Brown's attorney said Brown has serious mental issues, along with no criminal history. Senate Minority Leader Mitch McConnell pointed to a potential double standard and how this story will be covered. I'm confident that if activists claiming to be conservative tried to assassinate a politician, whatever his mental state, the media would open a 24-7 national conversation about rhetoric on the right. Somehow, I doubt attempted murder by a BLM activist will get that same treatment. Investigators said Brown appears to have acted alone, and the motive remains under investigation. 
For his part, mayoral candidate Greenberg says he was traumatized after finding out the person who allegedly attempted to murder him was just released on bail. Jason Perry, NTD News, New York. A COVID-19 vaccine requirement for firefighters and police officers has been paused in Boston. But the case is ongoing and there's still a chance these union workers will need the vaccine if they want to keep their jobs. NTD's Miguel Moreno has the story. Boston Mayor Michelle Wu set a January vaccination deadline for city workers. But that policy's been blocked by a judge who sided with three police and firefighter unions. The judge says a pause is favorable because unions and the public could suffer substantially if workers are fired. And that a pause would do little to harm the city's public health interests. According to the mayor's office, more than 95 percent of the public workforce is vaccinated. Wu's spokesperson said they're disappointed by the judge's pause, that they're reviewing it, and that city workers and residents deserve to be protected. The unions accused Mayor Wu of wrongly dismissing a test or vax agreement they had with the city by issuing the now paused requirement. The pause is in effect until the union's lawsuit is resolved. Miguel Moreno, NTD News. The Florida State House passes a bill banning abortions after 15 weeks of pregnancy. Republicans support the bill, saying it protects the unborn. Democrats are against it, saying it places an unnecessary burden on women. Currently, Florida law allows abortions up to 24 weeks of pregnancy. Arizona and West Virginia also passed bills this week banning abortions after 15 weeks. And on Wednesday, the head of the FAA, Stephen Dixon, announced he is resigning. He cited family separation during the pandemic as the reason for his exit. Transportation Secretary Pete Buttigieg described Dixon as a steady and skilled captain. Recently, the FAA has been criticized for its handling of questions surrounding 5G interference with aircraft. Dixon will officially step down on March 31st. And Hillary Clinton is back in the spotlight. She addressed the new New York Democratic Convention today. This amid allegations from special counsel John Durham. NTD's Iris Tao has more. Clinton! Hillary Clinton makes a comeback to the main stage, speaking Thursday at the New York Democratic Convention. I intend to work my heart out to elect Democrats up and down the ticket this November. But also in the spotlight is the ongoing probe by special counsel John Durham. In a court filing last week, Durham alleged that the Clinton campaign hired a tech company to establish a false narrative linking then-candidate Donald Trump to Russia. Clinton, however, is dismissing it. It's funny, the more trouble Trump gets into, the wilder the charges and conspiracy theories about me seem to get. Also on the move is Michael Sussman, the attorney for the Clinton campaign. Sussman filed a motion on Thursday seeking to dismiss Durham's charge against him. His attorneys say that Sussman did not make any false statement to the FBI and that the indictment is only about an entirely ancillary matter. Well, I think it's uh, terribly flawed. The law professor, Giustelino Colaris, says the argument is unlikely to stand. That he did. That he, in fact, made a false statement by not disclosing when he was prompted or asked whether he was acting on behalf of uh, uh, the uh, Hillary Clinton's uh, political uh, campaign. Or how likely do you think that it will actually get dismissed? Uh, to be very honest, uh, knowing the reputation of uh, Special Counsel Durham, I think it's extremely unlikely that this will be dismissed. Meanwhile, 46 Republican senators are now urging the Department of Justice to stay independent and give all the resources that Durham needs to proceed with the investigation. Reporting in Washington, D.C., Iris Tao, NTD News. Coming up, an NBA free agent nominated for the Nobel Peace Prize, his stance on China's human rights violations, and the outcry from his ongoing unemployment. And people working remotely are enjoying it, according to studies but it could end up hurting their careers. That and more here on NTD News.
NBA free agent Ennis Freedom has been outspoken about human rights issues in China. Now he's in the running for the Nobel Peace Prize. NTD's Dave Martin has more. Enos Freedom, formerly known as Enos Cantor, announced Wednesday he'd been nominated for the Nobel Peace Prize. Freedom, who spent more than 10 years in the NBA, has been out of a job since being traded from Boston to Houston last week and then immediately released. The move has sparked outcry among politicians, fearing politics played a part in it. The 6-foot, 10-inch center has been the rare professional athlete willing to speak out about the human rights atrocities being perpetrated by the Chinese Communist Party. Last month, in a press conference hosted by Senator Rick Scott, Freedom called the Chinese Communist Party a brutal dictatorship. In November, he tweeted about how the Chinese regime engages in forced organ harvesting and that Tibetans, Uyghurs, Christians and Falun Gong practitioners are all targeted. Freedom, who changed his name from Enos Cantor in November when he became an American citizen, has drawn ire from Beijing. Celtics games were pulled from Chinese video streaming giant Tencent back in October, following another Twitter post calling for an end to Beijing's ongoing repression in Tibet. Should Freedom win the award, the 29-year-old will be the fourth youngest to do so. Last year, there were 329 candidates for the prestigious prize. This year's winner will be announced December 10. Dave Martin, NTD News. Thursday's Olympic slate saw the U.S. women's ice hockey team battle for gold, Camilla Valieva's final routine, and more heartbreak on the slopes from Michaela Schifrin. NTD's Dave Barton has more. All the preparation for Camila Valieva winning gold was for not Thursday as the heavy favorite stumbled through a routine and out of a medal. Valieva, whose positive test for a banned substance at the Russian Championships in December prompted an emergency ruling by the Court of Arbitration for Sport to determine her eligibility, was shaky at the start before eventually falling twice in her routine. The shocking performance knocked her from the top spot she had occupied after Tuesday's short program and into fourth place, meaning the medal ceremony that was expected to be postponed because of her test was actually held. Instead, Valiva's fellow countrywoman Anna Sherbakova, the overlooked reigning world champion, won gold after landing a pair of quad jumps. In women's ice hockey, the inevitable U.S.-Canada gold medal matchup was won by the Canadians 3-2. Canada scored the first three goals of the game and held on as the Americans put up 40 shots on goal. The matchup was the sixth time in seven Olympics that these two have battled for gold, with Canada now taking four of those six. On the slopes, Michaela Schifrin's forgettable performance continued as the two-time gold medal champion got her third, did not finish in five individual races after losing control 10 seconds into the second leg of the Alpine combined, the slalom. Schifrin was actually fifth after the downhill but lost her balance at the 10th gate and landed on her hip. The two races Schifrin did finish placed her ninth in the Super G and 18th in the downhill while making her Olympic debuts in both events. Dave Martin, NTD News, New York. The Colorado State Patrol released dramatic dash cam video Wednesday to make a key point about highway safety. In this case, you can see a motorist pulling over to the far left, stopping close to a concrete median. Another driver didn't see the stopped car and the dramatic crash was caught on the officer's dash camera. Colorado State Patrol says there were no serious injuries and they released the footage to remind motorists that when they are asked to pull over, Pay attention and follow directions. If at some point during the pandemic you worked from home, you might have found that there are a lot of benefits to it. But many working remotely might be overlooking its possible negative effects on their careers. NTD's Arian Pazdar has more on the nation's work from home situation. You might say working from home is great because you can take a break and get a snack whenever you want. On top of that, you don't have to wear office attire but the remote option could hurt your career and your city's economy. According to a new study published by Pew Research, 60% of workers with a remote job want to continue working from home after the pandemic ends. That's up from 54% in 2020. So it seems as if people are liking the remote system, but what are they missing out on? The opportunity to really impress your supervisors and the bosses above them. Um, there, there's actually been some discussion of what they're now calling the Zoom ceiling, where it, if you're working purely remotely, you may actually have more difficulty advancing in your career. Because Dr. Arthur Markman is a professor and the executive director of the IC Squared Institute, which focuses on innovation and entrepreneurship. 
we don't get to learn by observation. When you onboard a new person, it's hard for them to learn what the culture is when they can't just watch what other people are doing. Because of remote work, New York City is seeing a 40-year high in vacancy rates in office buildings. The mayor says that might end up hurting the very people who are working from home. He gave an example. So that people can understand, if you are an accountant and you're staying home and it impacts that local diner, that local restaurant, it's going to, it's going to impact you. Eventually, you're going to lose your clients. Because if our restaurants close, if our small businesses close, who's going to give you the business? According to Dr. Markman, the hybrid system of working from home on some days and from the office on others might be the best option for employees, because this way they can impress their supervisors while also enjoying the benefits of working from home. Ariane Pastar, NTD News. If you recently bought some candles from Anthropology, we have an important recall to tell you about. The company says it has received reports of some of the anecdote candles flaming up and breaking apart while in use. So far, no injuries have been reported, but if you have any of these scents, Fireside Chats, which comes in a blue container, Weekend Getaway in green, Sweater Weather in pink, and Fall Feels in orange, you can go ahead and bring them back to the store. The candles were sold online and in the store from July 2021 through the end of the year. And still to come, new headlights coming to some cars. They're designed to shine less light on the road, which means fewer high beams in your eyes. And Disney has planning to build residential communities in California for those who want to live in the Disney paradise permanently. That and more here on NTD News. The performance was enchanting. I feel better about the world. I feel uplifted. It touches you. It really does. The expertise of the dancers was really, really strong. To know that it was live music was really fantastic. We didn't want to miss this. Make sure you see it. Have to come. Life changing. Coming to Lincoln Center, March 10th through the 20th. Tickets at ShenYoon.com. Here's what a reader writes to best-selling author James Cook about his new book, The Great Gold Comeback, Bankruptcy of the Welfare State. There is no way I could ever properly express my thanks to you for the Gold Comeback book and all that you have written within it. What a real treasure. Get this hard-hitting volume absolutely free. It covers economics, inflation, socialism, welfareism, capitalism, crashes, panics, interventionism, and crisis. Regularly $29. Yours free. Call 1-800-328-1860. Do you worry about going to the dentist? Well, relax. The Carefree Dental Card is now available in your area. Call the number on your screen and we'll send your actual card at no cost today. With the Carefree Dental Card, you go to the dentist whenever you need and you instantly pay a lot less. The Carefree Dental Card is just $15.95 a month. So call now and make going to the dentist carefree. Call 1-800-491-9193 to receive your Carefree Dental Kit. Larry Elder here, and I've got some great news for you. If you're tired of the censorship in this country, then you're in luck. You can go over to EpicTV.com and watch honest programs that don't spin the facts. EpicTV.com is a brand new, no censorship video platform where you can watch not only my show, but other deep documentaries, great program, wholesome movies that you can watch with your entire family. So head over to EpicTV.com. I'll see you there. Do you ever struggle to see because another driver's high beams are shining in your eyes? Well, that problem could soon be a thing of the past. Automakers will now be able to install adaptive driving beam headlights on new cars. That's according to a ruling from the Department of Transportation's National Highway Safety Traffic Safety Administration. The new lights are designed to shine less light on occupied areas of the road and more light on unoccupied areas. They're useful for highlighting pedestrians, animals, and objects without reducing the visibility of drivers and other vehicles. The ruling satisfies a requirement in the bipartisan infrastructure law. 
And Tesla cars facing a safety probe again. This time over claims that some cars unexpectedly hit the brakes while driving at highway speeds. Something called phantom braking. The National Highway Traffic Safety Administration says the models in question were equipped with Tesla's autopilot system, which lets the car steer and brake automatically. According to the agency, people told them their cars came to a brake without any warning, and often more than once in a single trip. No crashes or injuries have been reported in connection with the complaints. It's not the first time the NHTSA has investigated Tesla's autopilot system. Last summer, it launched a probe after several cases where Teslas crashed into parked emergency vehicles. And police made three arrests and recovered $16,000 of stolen retail merchandise in Southern California. The suspects are accused of being involved in a retail theft crime ring that hit stores throughout California and other states. The California Highway Patrol reported that three people were arrested for their connection to a suspected organized retail theft ring. The ring is accused of stealing $16,000 worth of goods and is said to hit stores all throughout California and neighboring states. The CHP says they rented a car last week in the San Francisco Bay Area and drove to San Diego County for the sole purpose of committing retail theft. A representative from a retail store notified authorities that they had spotted the suspects and expected them to commit thefts in their stores. The CHP says the suspects were seen committing thefts in several malls and were eventually stopped in Carlsbad by police after leaving the Carlsbad Outlet Mall. The CHP took them into custody and found stolen merchandise in their car. At least 329 items were recovered worth over $16,000. An investigation is still ongoing. Jason Blair, NTD News, California. Want a little more Disney in your life? Or maybe a lot more? The company announced on Wednesday it's planning to build residential communities in Southern California for those who do not want to leave the happiest place on earth. Disney announced it is planning to build new neighborhoods called Story Living by Disney. It's a kind of real-life never-never-land. Each area will be designed differently that aligns with Disney's branding and service. The community will span about 24 acres around an oasis in the city of Rancho Mirage in Coachella Valley where Walt Disney once lived. In a statement, the chairman for Disney Parks Experiences and Products said they are developing ways to bring the magic of Disney to people, expanding storytelling to story living. The statement said they can't wait to welcome residents where they can live their lives to the fullest. Trained Disney cast members will provide guest service to operate the residential communities. There will also be neighborhoods for residents over the age of 55. There will be a club membership for special experiences year-round, like wellness programming, live performances, cooking classes, seminars, and more. Disney did not announce when they will start construction or when it will be completed by. Neither did they announce the expected price. Virtual reality company Roblox didn't impress investors in its latest quarter, and it's the first major metaverse company to go public. So what are the major obstacles preventing the metaverse from becoming the future of the Internet? We talked to some experts to see how having a screen inches from your face can affect your eyesight. NTD's Chenny Wu investigates. Shares of metaverse company Roblox plummeted and remained low after they missed estimates. Their net loss of 25 cents per share was worse than estimates of 13 cents per share. Roblox is the first major metaverse company to go public. We need time. Amir Borzorgzadeh is the CEO of Virtuleap, which creates brain training games. Borzorgzadeh says developers require many years before they can achieve Mark Zuckerberg's vision that the metaverse will be the successor to the mobile internet. And there are many obstacles to that vision, such as the current technology and health concerns. What can you play on a smartphone? That's pretty much what you can play on a VR device right now. Borzuk Zadeh says the graphics are currently very limited because developers have to factor in spatial input. And there's no way you can compare them to the graphics on a PS5. Toggling between the real world and a virtual world today, they're very uh, clunky, they're very cumbersome. Bob Bilbrook is the CEO of Capture, a business business consultancy. Billbrook says headset weight is another factor, but that the technology is constantly improving. Groups like Qualcomm and others are are working on chips that can process a lot faster also. And as VR headset sales increase, health concerns abound. 
at the current stage that we are on, these devices shouldn't be used, in my opinion, longer than an hour per day. In fact, I would say like these are great devices for 20 minutes per session. Until we get better devices, motion sickness and eye strain are some reported problems. In regards to the impact on eye health, one expert says, We shouldn't set off uh, any major alarms about VR. Dr. Harry Bonesack is the president of the Canadian Association of Optometrists. Bonesack says VR isn't necessarily worse for your eyes than your phone. I know that all, all of our mothers told us, you know, don't sit too close to the TV. And now we've got a, uh, you know, we've got a screen literally, uh, you know, uh, you know, a fraction of an inch from our eyeballs. Um, is that harmful? I don't think we can say that it is. I think uh, it's likely that it's not harmful. Bonesack says the blue light coming from the screens is in itself a cause for concern, and it's really what the eyes themselves are doing that may cause strain. Chenny Wu, NTD News. Up next, Japan may be at a turning point when it comes to countering its communist neighbors. The country's self-defense policy could expand to include striking enemy military bases, but only when it's necessary for self-defense. And a deadly mudslide in Brazil has killed over 100 people. Residents and rescue crews are still searching for survivors. Find out more on NTD News. Japan could soon expand the scope of its self-defense-only military policy. The nation's defense minister says airstrikes on enemy bases may be employed, though strictly to defend Japan from foreign missile attacks. The move is in line with its recent effort to counter growing threats from China and North Korea. NTD's Tiffany Meyer has more on the situation. A turning point for Japan's national security policy. Striking enemy military bases on foreign soil could be seen as self-defense, according to Japan's defense minister. He made the point Wednesday during a parliamentary hearing, noting that the tactic could fall under the country's strict post-World War II self-defense policy. But there's a precondition. The strategy could only be used as necessary to protect Japan from a hypothetical missile attack. Japan's defense minister did not single out a specific threat. But his statement comes as North Korea increases efforts to launch missile tests this year. Japan's prime minister said last month that his country isn't looking to destroy a nation through the possible airstrikes. He also gave assurances that the action would not violate the country's pacifist constitution. The U.S. imposed the pacifist constitution on Japan back in the 1940s, when Japan lost the Second World War. It aimed to limit Japan's military moves to self-defense. That's to make sure the country would not launch another war. In light of that policy, Japan has been seeking to boost its defenses for some time, as it faces growing threats from its communist neighbors, North Korea and China. Speaking of Japan-China relations, a Japanese man is detained in China's largest metropolis, Shanghai. Japan's foreign ministry announced the news Thursday. The reason for the man's arrest is unclear. Japanese officials have asked Beijing to grant them permission to meet with him. According to Japanese outlet Kyodo News, 16 Japanese nationals have been detained in China over the last seven years. Nine of them were sentenced to prison for up to 15 years on various charges, including espionage. Nationals of other countries have also been held in China. Two of the most high-profile cases garnered international attention, known as the two Michaels from Canada. Businessman Michael Spaver and former diplomat Michael Kovrig were detained in China for over 1,000 days. In a move widely seen as retaliation, both were arrested in 2018, just days after Canada apprehended Chinese citizen Meng Wenzhou. Meng served as the chief financial officer of Chinese tech giant Huawei, and Canadian officials took her in on a warrant from the U.S. She was charged with misleading global banking company HSBC on Huawei's dealings with Iran, which could have led the bank to breach U.S. sanctions. China let the two Canadians go hours after Meng's release last year. Beijing denies the arrests came in retaliation. Following the advice to British citizens to leave Ukraine, families in Kiev are considering their options. For one British man and his Ukrainian wife, the decision is not easy. Here's more. 
Obviously, the advice is to leave Ukraine, but that's not practical for people like me. And British father Daniel Williams is facing an impossible choice. Should his family stay or should they go? The British businessman has been living in Kiev for two years and just recently had a baby with his Ukrainian wife. But with the threat of a Russian invasion, he's now preparing to move his family out of Ukraine's capital. We weren't going to do anything. Uh, my Tanya is as tough a Ukrainian lady as you'll find, and she is of the mindset, this is her country, this is her city. But when you have a child, when you have a young baby, you can't just pack up at a moment's notice. You can't hitchhike, scrap and fight your way out of a, of a city. So we decided on Friday night after the US and the UK advice came out to leave Kiev, we decided that at least we needed to get to a safer area within Ukraine, uh, at the very minimum. Uh, whether it meant leaving the country or not, we will decide as we see how the situation unfolds. The Williams family has packed suitcases, ready to depart for Western Ukraine at a moment's notice. From there, in a case of a war, they can leave the country through Poland if direct routes to Britain are cut off. Most airlines were, as of Wednesday, still flying in and out of Ukraine, but some have moved planes abroad upon requests from their owners or insurers. Williams said he would be sorry to leave Ukraine, as it's where he's felt most at home. On a personal level, I love this country. I love the people here. Um, we were very, very happy here. Um, and, you know, if, if Russians go back to base, we carry on being very happy here. A mudslide and flash flooding in a Brazilian city has killed at least 105 people and destroyed entire neighborhoods, according to local authorities. Residents and rescue crews are still searching for survivors. Here are the details. On Thursday, authorities said the death toll in the Brazilian city of Petropolis rose to over 100 and was expected to increase further. The local morgue was forced to use a refrigerated truck as backup as more victims were found. More than 500 rescue workers, along with neighbors and relatives, were still searching for possible survivors. A preliminary tally suggested at least 35 more people are missing. Others are looking for the remains of their loved ones, buried under the rubble and mud. I've got no words. I'm destroyed, destroyed because of everything we've lost. Our neighbors, our friends, the house, that doesn't matter. We are alive. What about those who passed away? I've lived here for 44 years. I've never seen anything like this, to die this way. My friends have all gone. My friends all died. The downpours, which on Tuesday alone exceeded the average for the entire month of February, caused mudslides that buried homes, flooded streets, washed away cars and buses, and left gashes hundreds of yards wide on the region's mountainsides. It was the heaviest rainfall registered since 1932 in Petropolis, a tourist destination in the hills of Rio de Janeiro state. More than 420 people had to leave their homes, taking shelter in local schools and other makeshift accommodations. Rio Governor Claudio Castro on Wednesday compared the damage to a war zone. Brazilian President Jair Bolsonaro has promised to help the region and said he would visit the affected areas on Friday on his return from an official trip to Russia and Hungary. Since December, heavy rains have triggered deadly floods and landslides across much of Brazil. A wildfire in northern Argentina has devastated over a million acres of land. Firefighters and residents have been battling the blaze for weeks. That's as several South American countries have been hit by a drought. Here's more. A wildfire has spread to cover around 6% of the Corrientes province in Argentina. That's nearly 1.3 million acres of land. On Wednesday, the local government reported 15 active outbreaks. Firefighters are working to bring the fire under control, and residents evacuated from their houses and a hotel near the provincial capital as a precaution on Tuesday. Local TV images show people trying to help herds of horses and cows flee the fire as the flames destroy the vegetation. The president of the Rural Society of Corrientes told local media that he hopes for strong rains to douse the blaze. He also says that the fields eventually will recover. 
Corrientes produces farm products including citrus fruits, rice, tobacco, yerba, cotton, livestock, and timber. Argentina is in the midst of a second consecutive La Nina, a weather event that typically brings less rainfall to its central agricultural regions, which are key to the country's exports and foreign currency revenues. Rainfall levels in the coming weeks will be critical. Fears over the drought in Argentina, Paraguay and Brazil have been driving up global grains prices. Hello, I'm Mike Lindell. Retailers, shopping channels and now even banks have tried canceling myself and my pillow. Well, during these times, your support has meant everything to us. My employees and I want to personally thank each and every one of you by passing the savings directly on to you. For a limited time, you can get my brand new product, My Slippers, for 50% off. That's the lowest price ever. And remember, My Slippers come with an exclusive four layer design. These layers combine to give you amazing comfort and support and help reduce stress on your feet. And with the durable indoor outdoor sole, you can wear My Slippers anytime, anywhere. I personally guarantee these will be the most comfortable slippers you'll ever own. So go to MyPillow.com now and use the promo code on your screen or call the 1-800 number below to get my slippers for 50% off, the lowest price in history. And if you do it right now, I'm going to include a free gift with your purchase. Thank you and God bless. The protest in New Zealand, following the example of Canada's Freedom Convoy, is beginning its 11th day. And while some call the demonstrations aggressive and intimidating, the protesters say they're promoting an atmosphere of love and unity. NTD's Grace Coulter has the story. New Zealanders protesting pandemic measures and restrictions in the nation's capital of Wellington are entering their 11th day, and they're showing no signs of leaving. A sea of tents covers the lawns of Parliament Hill, and the protest is now being called by some Rhythm and Government 2022. This is a reference to the New Zealand music festival Rhythm and Vines, because the protest has essentially turned into a mini festival of its own. The government, on the other hand, is calling the protest an occupation and says it's illegal. Police estimated Wednesday that over 400 vehicles remain parked in several streets along the parliament grounds, causing blockades. This protest was inspired by the self-described Freedom Convoy in Canada, and there are many parallels. Just like in Canada's capital, dancing, singing, loud music, barbecues, cotton candy and bouncy castles can be seen here. The protest has been accused of having muddled messaging and not being clear about what exactly the protesters are demanding. Here's how this protester, who's also filming the demonstration, summed up the movement. We're here for a purpose, remember? We're here for our freedom. We're here to end the mandates. We're here to stand for truth. We're here to repeal the COVID acts. But at the heart of it all, we're here to connect and bring Kiwis back together again. Just over a week ago, it appeared that the protest might come to an end. Around 120 protesters were arrested for trespassing or obstruction after the House Speaker closed the Parliament grounds. The police response drew criticism, and some officers were accused of using excessive force on protesters. This accusation was denied by the Wellington District Commander, who said police acted fairly and professionally. But this approach to ending the protest didn't have much of an effect. House Speaker Trevor Millard then came up with other methods to move the protesters along, like turning on the ground sprinklers. And when that didn't work, police blasted music like Baby Shark, The Macarena and Frozen's Let It Go on repeat. But both of these attempts just seem to result in muddy dance parties. You know I'm just telling you this, because I love you brother. And protesters continued to show up. Protesters earlier this week sent a letter to senior politicians asking for an urgent meeting. The House Speaker responded by stating that politicians won't speak with the protesters until several conditions are met. Vehicles blocking streets would have to be cleared and unauthorized structures removed. And what he called the intimidation of city residents would have to cease. 
But some politicians are urging the government to state a clear plan, detailing how they will de-escalate the protest and when they will end the country's mandates and restrictions. Grace Coulter, NTD News. CCTV footage captured images of a boy distracted by his phone, falling into a storage hole and being saved by a pile of boxes. Footage captured on Monday shows the boy walking inside a mall in central Istanbul with his mobile phone. Meanwhile, another worker dropped packages into the storage hole. The boy, who was texting while he walked along the corridor, slipped down the hole as the worker who left the lid open panicked. CCTV footage from the storage showed the boy miraculously falling onto the boxes and being saved without a scratch. And a special exhibition opening today at London's British Museum taps into the fascination surrounding one of the world's most famous prehistoric monuments. NTD's Neil Woodrow speaks to one of the curators at the opening of the World of Stonehenge. There's more to Stonehenge than a stone circle on Salisbury Plain. More than 430 items from the UK and Europe form what the museum says is a once-in-a-lifetime spectacle. The centerpiece is the loan of a 4,000-year-old Bronze Age timber circle called Sea Henge, also known as Stonehenge of the Sea. Stonehenge is situated in the south of England. It was constructed with what's known as blue stones from West Wales and is a site that becomes important at summer and winter solstices. But at this exhibition, it's all the other items on display that shed light on its mystery. One of the curators at the British Museum, Neil Wilkin, tells us about why the exhibition has brought these items together. So Stonehenge can seem quite an isolated monument, you know, um, almost sort of out of time and out of place. By bringing objects from the other parts of Britain and other parts of Wiltshire together in, in, in one place, we can put the monument in context. We can pan back and see how it fitted into a bigger picture. And what we think is really important is that to understand the mysteries of Stonehenge, to understand why people went to all the effort of building such an extraordinary monument, you have to understand more about the world in which it was desirable or possible to build such a thing. Wilkins says there's been a lot of recent research around Stonehenge and its landscape. One of the most important new discoveries is to pinpoint the origins of the blue stones in West Wales. And in the exhibition, we tell the story of how they were brought a remarkable journey right across Wales and England to Stonehenge. So we think that the people who brought them to Stonehenge might have been bringing them from their ancestral home, from the place that they maybe um, began their community or, or, or came from. At the time that Stonehenge was being built, there were many other fascinating monuments being constructed. Some in the Orkney Islands have been represented in the exhibition. But at the heart of the display here is a relatively new find, Seahenge, part of an oak circle that re-emerged on a remote Norfolk beach in 1998. Due to the shifting sands, a large upturned tree stump surrounded by 54 wooden posts was revealed. What it tells us about is a different scale of society to Stonehenge. Stonehenge was the, the temple of a, a people that came from across Britain and probably Ireland and beyond. But Seahenge is a much more personal monument, probably big enough for a community or even a family. So it's kind of like a shrine to Stonehenge's temple. Researchers know from dating the wood that it was built in 2049 BC. Wilkin notes that the survival of the 4,000-year-old timber circle is exceptional. We even know it was built in the spring and summer of that year. So we have a remarkable insight into the moment that the monument was built off the, off the coast of Norfolk in, in land that would later be inundated by the sea. Among the other many artefacts is the Nebra Sky Disc, which is thought to be 3,600 years old and the oldest surviving representation of the cosmos anywhere in the world. There are many gold items, one of which is an extremely rare 3,000-year-old sun pendant, described by the British Museum as the most significant piece of Bronze Age gold ever found in Britain. Solar symbolism is a key element of Bronze Age cosmology and mythology across Europe. This 5,000-year-old chalk sculpture, on display for the first time, was discovered on a country estate near the village of Burton Agnes in East Yorkshire in 2015. Wilkins says analysis of its carvings will help to decipher the symbolism and beliefs of the era in which Stonehenge was constructed. 
You have until July 17th to visit this exhibition and learn about the history and mystery of this ancient monument. Neil Woodrow, NTD News, London. And that's all for today's news. Thanks for tuning in. I'm Stephanie Cox. Thanks for watching us on YouTube. Did you know YouTube only keeps selective videos on its platform? So if you want to make sure you get the full picture, just subscribe to our newsletter. Go to newsletter.ntd.com and sign up.